Hello, I'm David Pollock and I'm from Woolene Station, which is situated in the southern rangelands of Western Australia. Uh, the southern rangelands comprise about one third of the state of Western Australia. It's a semi-arid area and like most of the semi-arid areas in Australia, it has long been used for pastoralism and it is now well and truly degraded. I'm not gonna spend much time describing how degraded it is because that's well documented. Uh, I'm gonna focus on what I believe to be the low hanging fruit that we as Australians and as pastoralists can take advantage of to fix the degradation of the past and set ourselves up for a much more sustainable future. Overgrazing has been the overwhelming cause of the declining condition of Australia's rangelands and good grazing management will be the solution. But it's not as simple as just making sure that pastoralists have the right amount of stock on their land. That's certainly important. And most pastoralists, in my experience, need to gain a much greater understanding of what their pasture is and what it should be in order to understand what the correct amount of stock is during different seasons. There's also plenty of us to learn about how to, how to manage from what it is now to what it needs to be in the future in order for our operations to become truly sustainable. But the domestic stock have traditionally been less than half the problem. The biggest cause of overgrazing comes from unmanaged animals, most of whom have not contributed to the pastoralist income. Things like goats, kangaroos and rabbits have had a far greater impact on our resources than domestic stock. This is for three main reasons. Firstly, there's simply more of them, more animals, but also more grazing pressure. The grazing pressure of 120 rabbits is roughly equal to 15 kangaroos or eight goats or one cow. Throughout the history of pastoralism in the Southern Rangelands, the combined grazing pressure of these unmanaged animals has nearly always been greater than that of domestic stock. This is especially true in dry times and droughts. In 1991, the West Australian Department of Agriculture estimated that 61% of the grazing pressure was coming from kangaroos and goats. 49% coming from kangaroos and 12% coming from goats. And of course, they couldn't count the rabbits. Secondly, unmanaged animals are exactly that. They're not contained by fences and consequently they go wherever they please. And if a pastoralist cannot control at least half of the grazing pressure on their property, then that pastoralist is not effectively managing their land. This is particularly true if the landscape is in poor condition, because even a very small amount of grazing can slow the recovery of biodiversity in this case. The simple truth is that we have never had enough control of the grazing pressure to say that we've been adequately managing the pasture in our Australian rangelands. So now we have two of the three reasons that unmanaged animals have had a far larger impact in Australian rangeland resources. The third reason is a combination of the first two and relates to the mindset of those that manage pastoral enterprises. The prevailing mindset is that controlled grazing is impossible on large properties. The mindset has come about for good reason mostly because, because most of the history of Australian pastoralism, good pasture management has been impossible to achieve in the face of large amounts of unmanaged grazing. From a pastoralist perspective, there's never been any point uh, trying to recover an overgrazed patch of land by removing their sheep or cattle from that area because the unmanaged grazing continues regardless, ensuring that recovery is either non-existent or slow to the point of being economically unviable. And that's a big reason why in the past 150 years of pastoralism in Australia, we have made almost no inroads into developing sustainable grazing systems for large arid and semi-arid properties. The vast majority of Australian stations continue to use a system known as set stocking, whereby domestic stock are left to graze in the same area indefinitely. That's because pastoralists who are unable to manage 60% of the grazing animals soon give up on managing the remaining 40%. Pastoralists reason that their best chance to make the most of, of their pasture is get their own stock to eat it before the kangaroos do. But set stocking is an entirely inappropriate grazing system and it has decimated our pastoral resources. It has done so not only in Australia, but in rangelands worldwide. Set stocking ensures that pasture plants never get a break from grazing. And it has led to most of the best pasture species being systematically removed from our landscape, often to the point of local extinction. In the southern rangelands, we are now faced with a situation whereby we no longer have any of the fabulous grazing plants that excited the first pastoralists into moving here in the first place. Any responsible grazing system must allow the most palatable plants time to rest from grazing. These more appropriate grazing systems are generally known as rotational grazing. There are many manifestations of rotational grazing and generally the more developed they are, the better they work. But even rotating the stock from one side of the property to the other side every year is a vast improvement on the set stocking model. Yet rotational grazing has been practically impossible to achieve in the southern rangelands and many other rangeland ecosystems across Australia because the impact of unmanaged animals has rendered them unworkable.
So what is the solution to the problem of the unmanaged grazers? The solution is not a new thing, but it does require that hardest of all things, a cultural shift. By far the cheapest, most guaranteed to be effective thing we can do as Australians to recover our rangeland resources, whether it be for production or conservation, is to stop killing the dingoes. Dingoes are the natural predator for kangaroos, and consequently kangaroos are in plague proportions everywhere that the dingo has been removed. In my area, kangaroos represented about 50% of the grazing pressure. This has made rotational grazing or simply resting paddocks a waste of time, as pastoralists never had enough control of the grazing pressure to make a difference. In many areas, this has led to a, a complete loss of perennial ground cover and widespread erosion. So I believe good pasture management in the southern rangelands is practically impossible without the dingo. The same could be said for almost all of Australia's semi-arid and arid pastoral regions. I say almost because there may be some exceptions. For example, some pastoralists have erected kangaroo-proof fences. This is an expensive option, but necessary if they want to run small stock as well as practice good pasture management. The problem with fencing is that most pastoral stations in Australia are very large, with the increasing size being a reflection of the low productivity of a dry climate. Exclusion fences can be feasible on small properties because those properties are situated in areas with higher rainfall and are therefore more productive. This means that less fencing is needed per hectare to protect land that is of a much higher productivity. So this means that that land is more productive and has much higher capacity to pay for more in intensive infrastructure like pest-proof fences. On the vast majority of stations, however, far more fencing is needed for far less productive land. This means that the larger the property, the less likely it will be that fencing out unmanaged animals is economically viable, especially considering the future maintenance and replacement of those fences. So the most viable option on larger properties is to make use of the dingo or to control the unmanaged grazers with one important caveat. You must run cattle instead of sheep. Cattle are much less susceptible to predation by dingoes for the simple reason that they are a much larger animal. There are many things that can be done to cut the predation from cattle to almost zero. The most important thing is to reduce the distance calves have to walk to water. And this is a byproduct of the good pasture management that can be achieved through rotational grazing. I believe that Australians have little choice but to wean themselves off running sheep and goats in semi-arid regions if they want to protect their vast and valuable rangeland resources. Everyday Australians do have a say in this because pastoral land is not owned by pastoralists. It's leased by them for the, from the Australian people. It's not a case of my land, my decision. Pastoral land is everybody's land. And just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that we immediately swap out all the sheep with cattle. But as a nation, we need to start the conversation about how we're going to transition from our current practices, which have proven to be incredibly destructive, towards those that recover and utilise our resources. And there is a lot at stake. Pastoralism in semi-arid and arid regions is the largest land use in Australia, covering around 40% of Australia's land mass. If Australians are committed to a sustainable future, then this issue demands immediate attention. And yet, throughout Australia, dingoes are maligned by producers and the general public alike, by producers through adherence to the cultural norm of believing that the dingo is our enemy, by the general public through a sustained campaign of misinformation that is directly contrary to the available science. This can be summed up by the substitution of the term wild dog for dingo. These terms conjure up very different mental images. If you believe that there are anything other than a tiny fraction of dogs living in the wild that are not genetically proven to be dingoes, then you have been misinformed. The fiction of the wild dog has been created over the past 20 years to enable the Australian government to continue dingo culling, much of which is carried out in such a way as to be considered inhumane by modern standards. The single largest move towards restoring the dingo to its rightful level of immense ecological and productive worth would be to discontinue the use of the term wild dogs to describe dingoes. The, ding dis the discontinuation of this term by all government funded programs should, in good conscience, be a policy enacted by federal and state governments. This move could easily be justified by the recent, current and ongoing genetic research which overwhelmingly shows that public funds are not currently being used to kill wild dogs because they are so few in number that it is arguable that they don't even exist in Australia's wild places. The reason the government is able to continue with this fallacy is because the definition of the term wild dog, as it is described by government agencies, includes purebred dingoes. But the fact of the matter is that that's practically all it includes. So why don't we just call them dingoes like we used to? The natural effect of 
of a reinstatement of suitable terms would mean that the general public would be aware of what their money was actually being used for. I believe that most Australians would not approve of the wholesale removal of Australia's top order predator, especially if they take the time to read the mounting body of scientific evidence showing that it is essential for the ecologically sound management of the most of Australia's usable land mass. Consequently, programs that are currently funded by the Australian government to kill dingoes would falter, and I believe that they would eventually disappear altogether. So we don't have to legislate that rangeland properties run cattle instead of sheep. All we have to do is stop government spending on the elimination and control of dingoes. This includes money spent on dingo proof fences in inappropriate places. Most land, rangeland properties will switch to cattle of their own volition, or they'll have to, as without government funded persecution, dingoes will reclaim most of their former territory. Small stock producers will switch to cattle, and if they are clever about it, they will do so before the dingoes arrive. I would argue that the point at which sheep once again become a suitable enterprise is also the point at which the landscape's natural productivity mean that properties are small enough to pay for their own exclusion fences. It is also the point at which management becomes intensive enough that those properties have the capacity to control their unmanaged grazers themselves. For the record, I'm all for the government's support for the affected properties to help them transition through this period. But that begs the question, where would the line be drawn as to who must be helped? As, I, as a guide, I would say that any area or property that has not historically had the capacity to keep unmanaged, unmanageable grazers to levels that enable sustainable management would benefit from having dingoes. I'd like to reiterate that I'm not against the humble sheep. It's not the sheep that's the problem, it's the fact that you can't have sheep and dingoes in the same space. And without the dingoes on large properties to manage the total grazing pressure, there's almost no likelihood that the landscape will be managed sustainably. And that is what is important. If we continue to degrade our soil and pasture, the sheep will not survive there for much longer anyway. If the government enacted a policy of not harming dingoes, the unmanaged grazing pressure would at last be lifted from the rangelands and the recovery would begin. All that I've outlined here is exactly what has happened in the Southern Rain Zones over the past 20 years, with the exception that the government has wasted a lot of money fighting the dingoes when that money would have been much better spent helping pastoralists to transition. Now it is possible for pastoralists in my area to realise the benefit of grazing systems, which are more profitable and more productive. Once those systems are embraced, we'll be on the path to a sustainable future. There is one other point I'd like to make, and that is, the dingoes are not only essential for good grazing management, but they are also essential for the native fauna of rangeland areas. Wherever dingoes have gained a foothold, they've, they've completely removed the fox in the southern rangelands. They've affected the cat numbers, though it does remain to be seen uh, if they can remove them completely. Australia has the largest extinction rate of mammals in the world, and I believe that will continue for as long as we deny the dingo its ecological role. I have been asked to present one key next step forward, and it must be that the Australian government and any organisation that it funds ceases to use the term wild dogs to describe dingoes. Perception is everything here. A very different mental image is created in the minds of the general public by these terms. And they do not understand that when agencies talk of wild dogs, that what they really mean is dingoes. It is irresponsible and counterproductive to the good management of Australian resources for our government to continue to be complicit in misleading the public in this way. Lastly, I'd like to sincerely thank the Royal Society of Australia for giving me the opportunity to highlight this issue. Thank you very much.